Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidos to the Soccer Metrics Copa Libertadores show, a production of Soccer Metrics and Soccer Down Here, the only English language podcast that are the South America's premier club competition. I'm your host, Howard Hamilton, the founder of Soccer Metrics. Normally, I would have a segment of news items surrounding the Libertadores, but all the news surrounds the eight knockout ties. So let's get right to it. We already know that two Brazilian teams and one Argentine team will be in the last eight. Two other sides are guaranteed to be from neither Argentina nor Brazil. By Thursday night, we'll know the identities of all eight quarterfinalists. Now, there are two things to remember. One, it's an aggregate goal series, and away goals are not a tiebreaker. And second, if the tie is level on aggregate at the conclusion of the second leg, it will go straight into a penalty kick shootout. Now, let's start by looking in the top half of the bracket. In quadrant one, Atletico Minero hosts San Lorenzo at, in the meter round. This tie is level on one goal apiece. Now, if you're a follower of Brazilian football, you're probably wondering why this match is being played at the meter round. And the reason is that Atletico's home field, uh, Arena MRV, has been played with problems in the quality of the pitch since that stadium opened last year. In the most recent league match against Cuiava last on Saturday, a match in which Atletico drew 1-1, the match was played by massive divots that appeared on the field and turf that was slipping underneath the plant feet of the players. Needless to say, it was a very dangerous pitch. It was a pitch that made it difficult to play football. And it was a pitch that both teams expressed concern about headed into the Libertadores encounter. As a result, the club officials, as well as officials in Minas Gerais, agreed to move the home match from Arena MRV to Mineral. And that decision took place on Sunday. With respect to the match, Atletico will have the reappearance of attacker Eduardo Vargas. And it doesn't appear very likely that Daverson will be up front with Paulinho. Uh, Paulinho is the star of this team with Hulk not being available. With respect to San Lorenzo, they lost in the league to Boca Juniors 3-2 on Sunday. Most of the uh, players who featured in the Libertadores and Counter last week uh, were rested ahead of this uh, league match. But San Lorenzo manager Landro Romagnoli will have Johan Romagna back from suspension. One big change that Romagnoli has made is that he has swapped out the starting goalkeeper and team captain Facundo Altamirano for Gaston Gomez. And this has been a result of um, some really poor decision making by Altamirano in recent matches. This will be a tie in which goals will be at premium. San Lorenzo are more than likely to play for the draw. And if any team is more likely to produce a goal and eventually score one, it's likely to be Atletico. So I expect Atletico to get the goal, at least one goal that is required in order to advance to the final eight. The other tie of this quadrant sees Fluminense host Gremio. This is a tie in which Gremio won the first leg 2-1. Fluminense are entering this match having drawn uh, goalless with Corinthians. 
That's a result that sees both teams in the relegation zone of the Brazilian championship. Manager Mano Menezes is looking to make changes to the left flank into the midfield. In particular, he, in particular, the news from Brazil is that he is likely to replace Escardinha with Guga. Now, there are a number of changes that are enforced due to injury. Marcelo, Diogo, Barbosa, and Ignacio are among the injured players for La Flu. In addition, Alexander is no longer with the club. He's been transferred to Al Akhli in, uh, in the Middle East. Now, Fluminense will benefit from the return of a couple of key players, uh, Paolo Enrique Ganso and John Arias. For Gremio's part, they lost 2-0 uh, to Bahia in the Brazilian League. And they have a number of enforced uh, absences. Uh, Rodrigo Eli suffered, or Rodrigo Eli received actually a red card in the first leg, and he will be suspended for this match. In addition, Pepe and Duque Roche are out due to injury. But Gremio will have the return of Walter Kahneman, who has been a standout defender for the side for the last uh, seven or eight seasons. And interestingly enough, Gremio have never lost a Libertadores match with Kahneman in the lineman. There's some internal debate on numbers uh, to deploy the back line, but they're more than likely to stay with the first leg setup. Now, one change that uh, will happen in the second leg compared to the first is that Martin Braithwaite, the new arrival for Old Tricolor, is likely to start up top for the team. Um, he played in the first match, and you know he did have a positive impact for uh, for Gremio uh, in their comeback win. This is going to be an interesting tie. Uh, neither team is playing extremely well at the moment domestically. Um, they're about they're about equal in talent. Um, and I would I expect I, I think I would not be surprised to see Gremio uh, come out of this uh, winning the tie, either on aggregate or on penalty kicks. Now, moving on to quadrant two. Junior de Barranquilla was Colo Colo in Colombia. Colo Colo, Colo, Colo won the first leg 1 0. And in their respective league competitions, Junior defeated Fortaleza 2 1, while Colo Colo defeated Coquimbo 2 0. The first leg was characterized by tight spaces and a defensive lack of control at one moment that resulted in the lone goal of the match. Expect more of the same in the second leg. Junior only need one goal to equalize the tie and send it to penalty kicks. But Colo Colo have proven to be one of the best defenses in the competition. Um, it is a tie in which I expect goals to be at premium chances to be at premium. The key player for either side will be Arturo Vidal for Colo Colo. Vidal hasn't practiced much, but nevertheless looks likely to be in the lineup. He even had time to appear with fans who gathered outside the team hotel, and he took photographs, signed, signed autographs, and participated in a number of Colo Colo chants. So, Either way, it looks to be a very interesting match on the Atlantic shores of Colombia. The other match of the quadrant sees River Plate host Tajeras de Corta. 
River Plate achieved the lone away team victory in the first leg, winning 1-0. Um, Tajera suffered uh, the red card expulsion to Lucas Suarez, who will be out for the second leg. And they also suffered the departure of arguably their best player, Roman Sosa, who was transferred to Nottingham Forest in the English Premier League. Now, they are likely to see the return of Ruben Bota, uh, who returned to train uh, over the weekend, and Matias Esquira. Now, over the weekend, Tajeres, playing an alternate lineup, came back from a goal down to beat Independiente Rivadavia 2-1. Now, for River Plate, Marcelo Gajardo, who recently returned to replace Martin Di Michelis, rested a number of players over the weekend in their league match against Gimnasia de la Plata, a match that River drew 1-1. He'll have Miguel Borja and Facundo Colidia back from injury. Another big, another important addition for River is the addition of Marcos Acuna, the World Cup winner and defender and current defender at Sevilla. He won't be available for this time, but if River advanced to later stages of the competition, Acuna should be available for the Neath Narnies. This is a tie that is still open, um, and Tajeres are definitely a side that's capable of surprising. They're sixth in the championship, they're sixth in the Argentine league competition uh, currently. Um, they're actually the better side on form, uh, despite their reverse in, in Cordova. Nevertheless, River Plate are the side with more talent and the one Argentine side that is most capable of challenging the Brazilian teams for a Libertadores title. And now let's look at the bottom half of the bracket. Quadrant three sees Sao Paulo host Nacional. This is a tie that is level on aggregate, uh, nil-nil. Nacional drew 3-3 in the league to River Plate, the Uruguay version of River Plate, on Sunday, while Sao Paulo lost 2-1 to Palmeiras over the weekend in the Brazilian round. Sao Paulo will suffer the losses of Ferrer to, due to a quadriceps injury, and he'll be out for at least eight weeks. So he, assuming that Sao Paulo get far enough in the competition, he may not even be available until the semifinal, the semifinal round. And Patrick, um, who went up for a contested header and landed on his head. Um, a really scary uh, head injury, but he appears to be uh, he appears to be conscious and out of significant danger. And the loss of Moreira. Now the key player for Sao Paulo will be Luciano. Luciano, um, who is in his early 30s, is a striker who has shown up for. Otri Kolar in elimination matches and finals. Since 2020, when he joined the club, he has appeared in 50 elimination matches or finals for the team and scored 19 goals. And these are important goals too, goals that either put his team into the lead, uh, tie the match, or um, or score or, or open the scoring. Uh, so he will be an important player for Nacional to, um, to look out for. Now the big controversy, the big off-field controversy is the issue of ticket sales. 3,000 tickets have been made available to Nacional fans as is customary in Libertadores competitions. As is also customary, ticket sales are the exclusive responsibility of the host club. 
But in the case of Sao Paulo Football Club, there are no means to buy tickets online. So the only recourse that Nacional fans have is to travel to Brazil and buy tickets in person on the day of the match. Needless to say, this brings up significant security issues involving the visiting fans. Um, and it's one in which, yeah, it's one that um, doesn't have an obvious solution. It, the obvious solution is to you know, update the technology on the Sao Paulo website, but that doesn't seem to be one that can be rectified in 48 to 72 hours. So that's going to be an interesting off-field um, event that, that it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's also interesting to see how Comet Ball will respond to that. The other batch in the quadrant sees Palmeiras host Botafogo, an all-Brazilian tie. Botafogo lead the series two goals to one. And in their respective league matches, Palmeiras defeated Sao Paulo 2-1, while Botafogo routed Flamengo four goals to one. Now, the big question is, can Palmeiras transform um, their advantage in possession and the scoring chances? Their league match against Sao Paulo uh, demonstrated the benefits of being able to convert possession into chances. Can they do that against the Botafogo? Fogo side, who is currently playing their best football of the season. Ofogal only need a draw to advance to the last day of the competition, while Palmeiras need a 1-0 victory to send the tie to penalty kicks and a two-goal victory to advance outright. And finally, we look at quadrant four. And this is a quadrant in which both ties will be played in La Paz, Bolivia, on separate days. The first tie sees Club Bolivar host Flamenco. Flamenco are coming into the match in La Paz with a 2-0 lead. Now, this is, this is a scoreline that is not the best scoreline for uh, Bolivar, but one that leaves them optimistic about the turnaround. In an interview with local press, Flavio Robato, the manager of Bolivar, said, the late goal hurts a lot, but they still feel very much alive in this time. And they are. They are a very different side at home uh, versus away which isn't too surprising to play at 3,600 meters. Now, their task will be not necessarily made easier, but Flamengo are entering this tie hobbled to a significant extent. They have injuries to at least six players, and at least three of them are out of this uh, second leg. Pedro? Gabriel Barbosa and Gerson are out. De Arisqueta could be out due to an adductor issue. De La Cruz and Luis Araujo um, picked up injuries in, in recent matches. And this is a string of injuries that's led Flamengo manager Chiche to complain about the workload um, that his team is under. And this is a really common refrain among the giant Brazilian teams. Um, they may have very large lineups, but they also play important matches every 72 hours. And they also play a significant number of Classico matches in which there is a lot of pressure to play as close to their first choice lineup as possible. Fans demand it. The directors demand it, the press almost certainly demand it. In the most recent match, they had a Classico over the weekend, and they lost that match four goals to one. Tiche will have Bruno Enrique back, 
he was suspended in the first leg. But those injuries and the workload are going to weigh heavily on Flamengo. Can they find a goal to um, make Bolivar's task a lot more difficult? It's very possible. They, they definitely have the talent. But Bolivar has um, a talented side as well. They have an experienced side, and they also have the benefit of altitude. So it would not be surprising to see this match either go to penalty kicks or be decided in normal time by Bolivar. The last match of this quadrant, and the last match of the round of 16, sees the strongest host, Peñarol. Peñarol are entering this match in La Paz with a much more significant advantage. They won their first leg in Montevideo 4-0. Over the weekend, they drew a goal list to so Largo on Saturday. They left Montevideo on Sunday, arrived in La Paz on Sunday afternoon to acclimatize, and they had the first training on Monday. Peñarol will have a number of players out, um, such as Ignacio Sosa, Mateo Spadi, and Nicolas Grossi. But they are likely to play the same lineup from the first leg. The one remaining tactical question is whether they will choose to play five in the back. Um, with four goals, they have um, a significant margin of error to, uh, to work from. Uh, they can afford to concede a goal or two. Conceding three would be a problem. And I think that would ratchet up the pressure for, uh, for the Uruguay side. But this is a team that I've considered to be the best team among the second place um, teams in the group stage. With respect to the strongest, they lost in the league 2-0 at Real Tomayapo. An interesting thing is that Ismael Rescalvo, who, was, who is the manager of strongest, took leave before the first leg and returned to Spain to accompany the birth of his first daughter. So his twin brother replaced them on the touchline um, in the match in Montevideo. I'm not sure if Ismael Rescalvo were there, that it would have made that big of a difference. But nevertheless, he's back in the, in the dugout to match the strongest in, in La Paz. Now, there is precedent for Strongest uh, achieving a 4-0 victory at home. They defeated Huachapapa 4-0 at home in, in the group stage. But Peñarol is a much stronger side than Huachapapa, particularly defensively, and also in terms of attacking talent going forward. Um, so, Despite the strongest having that significant home advantage, I expect Peñarol to survive in La Paz and advance to the final eight. So that wraps up this preview of the round of 16 of the Copa of Libertadores. And a reminder that you can stream every match of the tournament on Fanatis or Fubo Sports. If you prefer to listen to radio broadcasts, in Spanish or Portuguese, many clubs and affiliated radio stations stream their broadcasts online or on YouTube. If you want to follow me and send a comment or question, my X handle is at Soccer Metrics. You can also send questions or comments to at Soccer Down Here or Jason Longshore at Longshoe. We'll answer your questions about the tournament in a future episode. And we do appreciate your comments as we strive to make this show better. I'll be back on Thursday to wrap up the second legs of the round of 16 and set the stage for the last eight. This has been the Soccer Metrics Copa Libertadores show, a production of Soccer Metrics and Soccer Down Here. See you later. 
Hasta luego y hasta más.